Hi, it's John with the South Bay Historical Railroad Society, the SBHRS here in Santa Clara, California. The SBHRS is a railroad preservation society, and we have a museum, two operating model railroad displays in HO and N scale. We have a library, we have a passenger waiting room recreation, we have a speeder shed, a tool shed, and a variety of other things. What you're about to see is a manufacturer's round table with scaletrains.com. In addition to manufacturers, we've had presenters come talk about modeling topics, about painting, about railroad history, and other items. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. How's everybody doing tonight? Can you, is my mic okay? Can you hear me? I can usually do this without a microphone. I'm that loud normally, so this shouldn't be a, a real problem. I want to thank the, uh, the organization for, come, for allowing us to come and for James setting this up. Uh, we had, we've traded uh, numerous emails over the last couple of days, kind of getting uh, the last things ironed out on this, and, and uh, we're excited to be here. Um, tonight, we're going to kind of share uh, several things. We're going to talk about who we are as scale trains, what uh, our vision is for our company, what our goals are, what we've been through in our first three years. And we're also going to be uh, you know, talking about what our future is. I uh, invite you to be uh, to participate. You can interrupt at any time. Questions, raise the hand, and we'll, uh, we'll we can stop and answer those questions for you. And uh, you know we'll, we'll uh, you know we've been asked anything, so you know there's nothing there's nothing uh, that's out of bounds. Uh, and if it is, you know we'll uh, dance around it like we typically do, and just kind of give you an answer, and we'll move on. But you know one of the things we try and do, we're a very transparent company. Uh, if you've seen uh, our Facebook posts or seen any of our online uh, stuff so far, you know, we try to be very transparent. You know, we're a company that, we're a small group, uh, four owners that are a very tight-knit group. Got, between the four of us, we've got over 125 years of hobby and industry experience. Um, we've got uh, Shane Wilson, who is our company president. Uh, he's back in Tennessee, where our, our World International Headquarters are at. And he oversees uh, basically everything, and the rest of us just listen to Shane and do whatever he tells us to do. No, seriously, uh, Shane's an awesome leader. He really is. And uh, he, he's in charge of all of our marketing, oversees the business and, and the day-to-day -day operations. And uh, without him, we would not be who we are. Um, we've got Joel Vera, who is our lead for marketing. He also does all of our artwork. That, is, that includes the art for the models. That includes packaging. Uh, everything that you see on the web page is stuff that Joe has created. Uh, the catalogs, yes, thank you. The catalogs, this is all Joe's work. Uh, the photographs, we have, uh, we have a gentleman that does all of our photograph work for us, but Joe is the one who pulls all that together and does all that work for us. We've got Paul Ellis, uh, he works with me on the development side. Nobody better in the business than what he does. Um, he's, Paul is the one who is, is the driving force behind the products that we do, the level of, of detail and accuracy. Um, I, I oversee the development side. I also interact with the, uh, our Chinese factories uh, and work with them as well. And uh, so that's, you know, that's the four of us. Typically when I'm traveling to China, I, uh, I travel probably three to four times a year. I'm over there for about a week at a time. Um, one of the things that we've found over the year, I've found over the years, I've been in the industry almost 20 years now, what I've found working with the factories over there is there's nothing like being in country face to face sitting across a table and, and discussing issues and situations with them because it you know when you think about the the context of them being 15 16 hours time difference depending on where you're living in the country um every every uh dialogue with an email is two days you send it today they receive it tomorrow, you get, a, you, you get a reply the next day. So you've lost two days just trying to get a yes answer out of a particular you know, project or an issue. So being able to be there is critical in building relationships, which is a big part of what we do, build a relationship with our factory, with the people that we work with over there, that's critical. And then also being able to be there, to be able to discuss things, look at drawings, look at samples, look at parts. There have been many times when I've been over there where we would look at a part and I would, be, I would be able to point out to them, here are the issues. You see these five things you need to take, you need to resolve these. The guy that I would work with would 
call in one of the engineers. They would speak in Chinese. They're back and forth for about five minutes. He disappears. 30 minutes later, here comes a new sample for me to review and take a look at. So whereas, you know, you've got transit time for shipping out of China, even, you know, quote unquote, overnight shipping out of China is not really overnight. It's actually several days uh, to get uh, to get to to us. So uh, that time in China is absolutely critical. Uh, it's, it's a key part to being successful. So uh, summer of 2013 is when Shane and myself sat down and we concocted this idea. Uh, I had uh, went to Shane and said, hey, you know, uh, this, thing's been, this is something that's been kind of gnawing at me for a little while, and what do you think about this? And Shane's response was kind of like, when can we start? Um, you know, we had, we had been, uh, both have been at a, at a previous company for a long time, had a lot of really great years, good time there, but really felt like we had reached our limit as, as to what we could do or what our options were there. And an opportunity presented itself that we just couldn't pass up. And so in, uh, like I said, in summer 2013, we started, uh, we, we discussed this fall of winter of 2013. We actually started laying out a business plan talking about what this was going to be, what was going to be involved, who, who, you know, what kind of dollars were going to be required, who was going to be involved, how many people we were going to need to do this. Um, you know, the same basic kind of concepts that anybody would go through starting a business. I mean, because at the end of the day, obviously, this is a business. Un you know, not, it's the same as any other kind of business. You've got profits and loss. You've got financial issues. You've got, you know, we just are, we're just very fortunate to be working in an industry that we really enjoy and have a lot of passion for. Moving on, then uh, May second, um, we we basically we the four of us turned in our resignations on that day, that, and basically two weeks later we were out and on our own. So uh, I was 17 years with the company. Uh, Shane was over 20. I was about seven years. Paul was in about seven years, and I believe Joe was a little bit longer than that. Yeah. So we you know we we made that move in uh, like I said May second. And, you know, again, the reasons, you know, we, uh, we felt like it was time. Um, we had some issues. We had, we had an 18-month non-compete agreement with our previous employer, um, which was actually okay because uh, we, we, thought, we naively thought that uh, 18 months, how are we going to survive for 18 months? What are we going to do? You know, little did we know that, uh, you know, that it was going to take uh, a lot longer to get, get this thing off the ground. And so... Um, you know, that was, you know, that's, that's, you know, that 18 months from the time that we left to the time that we unveiled at Milwaukee Train Fest, I think it was 2015, I think it was, um, you know, at that time when we unveiled at Milwaukee, we had the HO turbine samples, we had, um, we had the containers, we had the boxcar, we had, forgetting what else we had at that point, that might have been it at that um, but we had, you know, we, when you, and when you look at that turbine, the, basically that turbine's two locomotives and a freight car. Typical development time for a, a locomotive is going to be 24 to 36 months. Freight cars are 18 to 24 months. So we had all that developed, done, and had sam running samples at the show when we, when we launched the company. And one of the things that we were really, really wanted to do is, as a company is we really wanted to make a statement. We wanted, to, we wanted to let people know, you know, who we are and what we're about. And that we're not just another also ran. We want to be, you know, we wanted to really plant a flag. And so that was, you know, part of the goal uh, for the company. And, uh, you know, and, you know, again, we had uh, a lot of challenges getting there. Um, you know, the first week of July 15, 2015, uh, the word had gotten out through some people that uh, we, you know, that we, that had heard about us. And, you know, it became, it wasn't public, but the word was rumbling around that we, we're going to start this company, which obviously we had some concerns about because we weren't at our 18 months at that point. That proved to not be an issue. Um, we also, in uh, October 22nd, 2015, we were all down in Tennessee, and uh, we were preparing to be ready to go with this thing. And we got a, we got a, an urgent uh, Skype call. And for those who don't know what Skype is, it's basically internet phone. Uh, we got a call from our uh, project manager in China letting us know that they had molded the wrong bodies for the HO turbines and they had them decorated and wanted to know if we were going to be able to accept them. And uh, at that point, Shane and I jumped on an airplane and got over there and talked with them and they, we were there for a week 
they remolded the bodies, they decorated them, and they delivered them to us the night before we left Hong Kong to come back, come back to California. For any of us, anybody who's followed us from the beginning, when we received our first shipment of tank cars, we had a uh, slight problem with the uh, slight problem. We had a problem. We had a real we had a real problem with uh, couplers and, uh, and and trucks and screws, and we uh, we spent probably two weeks in March and April of 2016, basically everybody in Tennessee repairing tank cars, and it got. Uh, Shane's son nicknamed it Tank NATO, and uh, that's probably the best, the best way to describe it. It was, uh, it was not a pretty, pretty time, but I will tell you that we had some great friends. We had several people from out of state, friends and personal friends in the hobby that flew down at their cost to help us out. Uh, we had other, uh, you know, other uh, local people that were there as well. You know, a couple of the local clubs uh, also came, members of their clubs came to help us out with that, and it took a, it took you know, eight to 10, 12 hour days for almost two weeks solid to get that debacle straightened out. And so, you know, one of the things that we've learned, uh, one of the things that I've learned and, uh, you know, as uh, for a startup business is that you don't realize how much you don't know until you don't, until you realize you don't know it. And, uh, you know, again, for the four of us, we've got a lot of industry experience, but obviously that industry experience is very specialized. You know, we, uh, you know, Product development, product development, chain marketing, sales, those kinds of things. We've got uh, Joe doing the artwork, but none of us had ever arranged to get a container out of China. Need to figure out how do you know, how do you do that? How do you get a container out of China? You know, HR issues, uh, leases on leases and purchases of buildings. Um, you know, just a whole you know dealing with different states and taxes. We've got employees in three different states. We've got three different states. We've got to deal with tax related issues. Those are, you know, when you're working for a large company, there's some other department that takes care of that stuff. And you just get on the phone, you call them, you say, hey, he need you to deal with this. Well, you know, obviously as a small company with only four guys starting out, you know, we had to learn a lot of, a lot of things. And so it's been, a, it's been a great learning experience for us. We've built relationships with, the, with most of the railroads, a lot of the, the manufacturers as well. Uh, our, the uh, Tier 4 Givos for GE, we actually were able to get on property. We've got a licensing agreement with General Electric for that. So, you know, there has been, there were times, there were times when, you know, where there, that might have been an issue, but it isn't any longer. And most, all the railroads have been very good to work with. We've had very little, little issues and uh, the railroads, the manufacturers have been very helpful. So that's, you know, that's, you know, typically not a problem. The biggest, the bigger issue probably with that kind of stuff is when we're talking about products that are manufactured by someone who's no longer around. Talking about a, you know either a locomotive builder or a freight car builder that doesn't exist anymore, you know finding that information is always tricky, and that's probably one of the most from the development side. That's probably one of the most challenging parts of the development is being able to figure out who to talk to, where to go to get that prototype information. You'll notice that with several of our products, uh, the locomotives and freight cars, we're all, we are, most of them are offering in two different levels. We offer our rivet counter brand, which is our high, typically our highest level. That's going to have all the separately applied parts, all the extra printing, all the extra detail. And then we've got our operator brand version of that same model. It's typically, typically going to be a one-size-fits-all type of a body. It's going to have limited details. Still very nice. All of the, all the, uh, the detail that's molded into the model is going to be at a very high level, but there's just going to be less stuff there. And then we offer what we call an upgrade kit where you can add some of those parts. What that gives us is that gives us the ability to use a common set of tooling for two different products at two different levels, whereas most other manufacturers typically pick a product and they only offer it at one level. So, you, so from the business side, you've got to generate all your revenue from that one branding of that product. You know, when we do these products at two different levels, you know, you can say that that, pr that price for that tooling or that investment is going to be probably one and a half, you know, one, you know, one and a half as opposed to two separate products. So you're saving some money, some investment at that level, which also is very helpful. So I think that's probably one of the most unique things that we've done. And it's been very, it's been very beneficial. You know, what we've really tried to do is we've got products at every level based on where the hobbyist is, whether you're an entry level guy or you're someone who's been in the hobby for many years or somewhere in between, you know, Scale Trains offers products that meet 
all those various levels. And so regardless of where you're at, you're able to find a product in our brand, I think, that will we'll suit you. So I think that's, you know, that's probably the biggest thing and the most obvious thing. So the museum quality are going to be at a higher level. And the museum quality, the, the museum quality brand is going to be a brand that's going to be set aside for special projects. And th either things that are unique, like a big low turbine, uh, something that is, you know, that you're probably not going to see as a common model. And we did exactly the same thing for the turbine. We, we started with the museum quality and then added the rivet counter in behind. So basically, we just kind of moved up one, one set level and did the same process. So you're going to find more separate parts. You're going to find additional with the with the museum quality. You're going to find more lighting. You're going to find more sounds. So you're going to find some animation, things that are going to actually function, uh, and some additional detail as well. But uh, you know, again, both both coming from the same set of tooling. Again, more parts, more hand assembly, uh, and those kinds of things. So yeah, museum quality is going to be at a higher level. Typically, it's going to be things that are going to be related to either sound. Uh, functionality, you know, animation, things like that. So basically, this is this is the four of us as we were sitting around uh, working on the turbine project. Uh, this drawing that we're looking at, this is the actual uh, general arrangement drawing for the turbines. Uh, we were able to obtain a copy of those. Let's stop it. Um, that drawing is 15 feet long, and so we had it strewn out, strewn out across the table and down the sides and and. Uh, you know, one of the things that's really important is that, you know those those general arrangement drawings or those kinds of drawings super critical uh, because you know when you're talking about a locomotive or a freight car that's 50, 60, 70 feet long, it's awfully hard to pull a tape measure tight enough to get a real accurate measurement of what the overall length is or the wheelbase and such. So you know, whenever possible, we like to try to we try try to get those kinds of drawings from there. Then we can do additional field measurements, but that's a great place to start. Also, you know, obviously any books that we can lay our hands on, you know, any place that we can go to get information. So we've got, you know, multiple versions. This is uh, up, up in uh, at Union, Illinois, where the, uh, where the, where the uh, number 18 is at. Uh, we were able to get in there. They were, as, as you saw in the other video, they were very uh, helpful. And this is the gentleman that basically oversees and kind of cares for the turbine. That's his, that's his baby up at the museum. Uh, he helped us with all, with all of the, with a whole bunch of background information. Uh, you can see here Shane's working uh, on taking the measurements. Yeah, what we use is a folding ruler. Uh, this is this is a, a trick that I learned from another uh, another modeler. It's a great way to take measurements without actually having to measure anything. Basically, what you do, you take a folding ruler. Every every other inch, you mark it in black. So basically, you got black and white marks that are an inch long. You put you unfold it. You stick that thing in your picture. Take the photograph, and then our, the engineers can scale everything in that photograph from that ruler. So as opposed to the to having to sit down and take a bunch of measurements and, and write out a bunch of dimensions, you put that up there, makes it very simple for them to be able to uh, uh, to get those dimensions. So that, that, that is a, a great asset uh, when it comes to taking dimensional information. Got, everything's got to be documented. Um, again, we, you know, we've got one, even, even after having the, the, you know, the main drawing, general arrangement drawing, every small detail has got to be documented. From there, all that information is going to go to our engineering team in China, and they're going to they're going to take all those drawings, all those photographs, everything we supplied to them. Paul will typically will put together a package of information that's going to lay out product specifications, what the model is expected to do, what the prototype is, versions, uh, all the prototype background information. We send them that information. From there, they're going to develop these three D CAD drawings, and they're going to send those to us. We're going to review those for the dimensional accuracy. And it takes them, it takes them, you know, a couple of months typically to, to pull that information together. A lot of back and forth with the emails and such. But we've got a, we've got an excellent team of engineers. The the uh, gentleman that's in, that leads that team has been in the industry for a number of years, so he's got an understanding. And, and I will tell you, it's it's it continues to blow my mind the fact that these people have never been here, never seen a U.S. train at all and their ability to capture and understand what we're looking for with the information we supply is just is amazing. Once all of that is done, uh, we're going to start the tooling. Basically, what they're going to do is they're going to take uh, copper and make an electrode, which, is the, which has the detail as a positive cut into it. And then that is used to burn, into the ca burn cavities into the steel tooling to create the details. 
and so they're going to be using CNC to uh, to make the electrodes and then the EDM for most of the uh, of the process. Seven thousand electrodes were cut for the turbine project. That's the A unit, the B unit, and the tender. And you know, the, I mean, and that goes down to every little latch, every little rivet. And most of those details are typically done with two or three electrodes. They have what they'll call a roughing electrode that'll go in and and, and cut out the cut it, remove remove massive material to get to a position where they're able to do the fine details. And then they'll come in with a finished electrode and actually burn in the, burn in the final details. But things like a door latch or something going to require several different electrodes to burn at each and every door latch. And then you know each one of those is done individually. So it's a pretty laborious uh, process. But uh, you know, as you can see from the product, you know the, the level of detail is fantastic. But there's a again, you know, seven thousand electrodes. That, you know, it later, it you know, it was in trays that were as long as this table and twice as wide. And it was, there was there was a bunch. And uh, you know, those are those were held onto for a while. They in case uh, there's damage to the tool, if for some you know something happens with the tooling, they can reuse some of that to uh, to, to repair the tooling. Uh, but at some point, that's going to get scrapped, and they're going to move on to the next project. So. So what we've got here is, is uh, the injection molding. As the tool closes up, the sides and the ends close in on the core, which is the centerpiece that, that makes the hollow part of the inside of the body. Those four pieces close together. They inject the plastic into the tool, and then as it opens up, it's designed to pull those slides away from the body so that they can actually remove the part. Here we've got a young lady who is prepping some sprues for painting. One of the most important things to understand is what you can see here. You don't see any robots. This isn't like building phones or computers or televisions, things like that. It's hand labor. You know, for all of us that are model builders that still build, you know, models, the only thing, the only thing different here is we got more people building more models. It's the same basic process. Everything, hand labor for the painting, for the assembly, for the running, you know, all of it is done by hand. And as such, you know, it's going to have, you know, each, each model becomes an individual piece because of that. This is not unskilled labor. You know, these people are trained and they've got, you know, and again, they may not understand exactly what they're building, but they understand what the expectations are of the procedure that they're working on. And so, you know, you've got, you know, there's probably three to 400 people at the factory working on products. And a whole lot of them are very small uh, Chinese young ladies that have eyesight way better than mine and are able to put these small parts on with no magnification or anything. And it's just, it, you know, I guess another one of those things that just constantly amazes me as many times as I go over to see what's going on and how they're able to do this kind of work. Painting, this is, uh, this is a gentleman who's doing the base coat painting. Uh, typically, and they use a water curtain mechanism. Basically what they do is they've got a shower of water in the back of the spray booth, catches all the overspray, drops it into the water, and they can clean that out later. Um, bodies are sprayed, uh, depending on the product, will either be sprayed as a group on a tray or individually, depending on what's going on. Um, but again, that's going to be the base coat, base coat painting. From there, it's going to go to it'll go to masking. So here we've got some guys in in the masking department. Those masks are made out of copper, and they're done in a process where they're actually formed to meet the detail of the body, so that the, those bodies fit very snugly into the into those masks. But as you can see, still the, still requires pressure. They've got a vacuum system that pulls all the overspray and everything back into that. Into, the, uh, into a ventilation system that cleans all that up. This is the printing department, pad printing. For those that are not familiar with that, the pads are made out of a silicone material. They're perfectly smooth. There's no detail on the pad itself. The, uh, the, the printing plates in the back are in, that are in the ink well in the back of the machine, and we'll see that in a second, actually has the detail etched into it, and it's only a couple of thousands deep. Um, the, uh, the blade in the back of the, on the back of the machine drags the ink across the plate, and floods the plate and then as it comes back it clears that plate off and only leaves the ink in that burned cavity. So again you're looking at you know with the UP shield obviously three different colors multiple impressions. So again you know hand labor touch-ups by hand. A whole lot of ladies over there with little dishes of paint touching up you know issues or concern you know the areas. Here you can see a young lady packing parts you know and final packaging for the box cars. Uh, we use the vellum to protect the uh, the bodies. You'll see that in most all of our products. Just using a wooden stick there again, something you know, not metal, wood, so that everything is you know tr trying to you know trying to minimize any kind of damage, eliminate damage. Um, 
but again, everything by hand. So these gals are obviously packing up the, our uh, scaletrains.com boxcars. These were some of the first production of the boxcars that were getting wrapped up when we were over there on one of our visits. We have got up here on the table a product that you can come and take a look at. Feel free to pick it up. Um, we'll be around. You can ask all the questions that you want. We've got catalogs up front here. Be sure and take one of those. There's also some business cards with our contact information on there. Also some uh, registration things. You can sign up for our newsletter. If you haven't signed up for our newsletter, you want to do that so you get the latest information. We're sending out newsletters all the time. The, uh, you can always follow us on our Facebook page and check out our website, www.scaletrains.com. I think that's it. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you for watching our Manufacturers Roundtable with Scaletrains.com. This is just one of many events we do here at the SBHRS, including modeling clinics, historical talks, and other events. We look forward to seeing you come on down to the depot. You can find us at 1005 Railroad Avenue in Santa Clara, California. You can find us on the web at www.sbhrs.org. And we're open every Tuesday night from 5 to 8 p.m. and every Saturday from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Thanks again. Have a great day.